Boa noite, malta. Aqui estamos. Mais um episódio de Three Bounces. Hoje vamos fazer um episódio em inglês. Já vamos na nossa terceira língua. Vamos tentar bater o recorde e fazer... Todas as vamos línguas. fazer algo em francês. Olá, Miguel. Olá, Ricardo. Olá, João. Olá, João. Está tudo bem? Tudo bom, ótimo. Preparado para este Olá. programa. Preparadíssimos. Uh, não sei se temos aí alguém em inglês. Uh, if you have any, any English viewer, well, welcome to, to our channel. Uh, my name is João. We are here with Miguel and Ricardo. And uh, we are three tennis coaches. And uh, today we'll be here having a conversation with Paul and Account that you'll, we're going to bring him now. Paul, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. My Portuguese is no good. I can't speak. Yeah. I, 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 only, I only can speak a little English, barely. So no, no Portuguese, <laughs> a little English. <laughs> Maybe by the end of the show, you, you'll be able to talk some Portuguese. Yeah. 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 Imagine with your experience in 2000, with the, when the finals were here in Lisbon, maybe you learned something, no? Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember back 2000. Great venue. Yeah. We had a, a great uh, a great tournament there. It was beautiful. Been too many years, but I, I loved it. Did Guga, did, did Guga win yeah. that year? Yeah, Guga won yeah. that year and became uh, number number one in the world. That's right. That's know. right, yeah. Nice for him. It was bad coaching for me in the semifinals again. <laughs> I coached bad that day, and he beat Tampa. I think you Guga won because he was a Portuguese and spoken, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Good. Brazilian, you know. Uh, so Paul is one of the greatest coaches at the moment in the circuit. He has a, a very long experience. He coached Federer, Pete Sampras, just small guys, you know, not such a big players. And then Tim Enman, Sloan Stevens, and many other players that you've been helping during your career. So I'm very thrilled to be able to talk with you about tennis. We will start with the first question that uh, the United States may be the most accomplished nation in the history of tennis. But since Pete Sampras and Andrade Agassi, apart from Andy Roddick, The uh, United States has found it very hard to make a top player. What are the main uh, reasons for this absence of a great player? I think in the United States, you know, some people think that the size of our country so big is good. And, and I actually think for tennis, it's difficult because we can't get very easily the best young players together all the time. They're in different locations around the country. And I think as a development coach, it's very important to get the young players of similar ages competing and growing up together. And then when you do that, you tend to have more and naturally they push each other to a higher level. So that's one reason. And the other reason I think in the United States, unfortunately, our bigger sports, football, American football and NBA basketball and baseball, tend to take more of our young athletes. They take our young athletes. It's a little more easy to play at a young age. All of the schools do it. It's less expensive. And so I think that that is a challenge. Um, and I also think that some of these things go in cycles. You know, sometimes you have a, an era or a few years where you have a bunch of very good players, and then you have an era or a few years where there's not so many. And you're right, since Andy Roddick retired, we've struggled. James Blake was in the top five of the world. Marty Fish got to top 10. But right now there's a few young Americans. One of them I help, Taylor Fritz, I'm helping to coach right now, who's 22 years old and he's around 24, 25 in the world. And Francis Tiafo, Tommy Paul and Riley Opelka, all four of those are, are like what I said. They're all grow up together and they've all yeah. played together. And now all of them, somewhere around top 50. And so they're pushing each other through the ranks. So that's helping them. It's, it's funny, the, the first reason you mentioned it, because in Portugal, mm -hmm. we are such a smaller country compared to USA. And people here complain that if they have to travel like one hour by car or an hour and a half, <laughs> it's too far to, to, to compete at a, at a reasonable level, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it helps us to, to make things in perspective. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. The end, one one hour, and it takes it takes eight days to drive from California to New York. You know, so everything <laughs> everything is different. But I, I like the idea of getting the young players together. And and I started at Balateri's long, long time ago. And when I was there, Jimmy Arias was there. Maybe you remember a name. Pablo Araya was down there. Um, mm -hmm. Rodney Harmon. We had five or six players that ended up in the top 50 of the world. And we're playing together every day, every day, every day. And just the natural competition of pushing each other, I think, helps a lot. And you have one player or two sure. players in isolation. I think it's actually more difficult. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, nowadays a top player uh, has to play at the highest level at all surfaces and working on clay court is a great way to develop uh, footwork, mobility, effects. Uh, do you think that uh, the lack of clay courts in the USA is one of the issues? I do, yes. I mean, most of the courts have been hard courts here in the USA. I think the clay court style of play and just the mentality of the movement and the point construction is very important. Um, obviously, on, on hard courts, you get the bounces are more similar. Things are easier to deal with. So I think in the last kind of 10 years, 12 years, we've tried to expand more clay courts in the United States. And, and for many years, Jose Higueras. The, the normal Spain, clay courts or the green ones? The, the bad ones in the States, the green <laughs> ones, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, but in the last decade or 15 years, Jose Higueras has been helping the United States Tennis Association to try to get the yeah. mentality, the different understanding, and I think some of our young players are better, getting better at. It. Taylor Fritz got to the finals of French Open Juniors a few years ago, and Tommy Paul beat him in the finals. So some of the young American guys and ladies now are getting more comfortable on the clay. Even though it's not the good red clay, it's the green clay, which is yeah. I don't like as much. It's more slippery. I don't like the green mm -hmm. clay as much, but you still have green to slide. Guys. Yeah, yeah. You still have to slide and construct the point. So I think it helps a lot. But you, is that because the US is such a big country, you know, so strong financially? The USPTA uh, has a lot of money. So you think it's like, it's because they really believe that they don't need the clay courts or? there's any other reason, you know, because you see around the world, everyone is having a, a lot of, you see the big academies all have like play and hard courts, you know, so why they don't invest them? But they are now, they are now. The bigger, the bigger private, uh, almost all the academies have both now. And, and some of the, the green clay is actually getting better because we have this, these new systems now where you water from underneath the courts, you know, the water comes up from, and, it's better than it than they used to be. So some of the green clay is actually pretty good now, and the academies are getting better. And the new USTA facility in Orlando spent a lot of money, so they have the clay courts down there. So I think it's getting more like it's growing, uh, but I think it will take time. And and um, I, I think also just the challenges of getting more players playing is something we need as well. Yeah, you think that the that's one of the reasons why why Pitt uh, didn't manage to win in Paris. You mean it wasn't the bad coaching, or <laughs> no? I okay. believe not. I believe it was not the okay. case. Let's see. Okay, Let's see what the end of the show. It wasn't the bad we coaching. Assume, we assume. Uh, okay, as long as it's not the bad coaching. Yeah, I mean Pete. Pete grew up in California, really. So he grew. He really grew up on hard courts, um, and and he was a great athlete. But the movement's very different, right? The sliding and the timing of the sliding. And if you watch, there's some Americans that are really good. I grew up, I actually mostly grew up on the green clay. So I, I could always slide and move well. Most Americans, if they don't, they end up learning to slide. the. They hit the ball and then they slide afterwards instead of sliding and as yeah, they finish before. the slide, they hit the shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that you learn by being on clay as a young player and the movement and the different kind of movement that you need. But I think for Pete, uh, look, he was so great that he was pretty good on everything. And he wasn't a terrible clay court player. He won the, I think he won the, he won the Italian Open, got to the semis of the French one year. Um, but I think the movement more than anything hurt him. And also, I also think back when Pete played, the 
the the difference in court speeds and the difference in style of play was very much more apparent than today. Like today, you can play almost the same way on all the different surfaces. Yeah. And if you watch the great players, they don't have to adjust very much. When Pete played, and he was playing Bruguera and Thomas Muster at Roland Garros, and it's slow and heavy and dead, it's very different. Whereas now, the surfaces on clay and grass and hard courts and the balls and technology, I think the variation of the style of play and also the different environments aren't so different. The movement's different. You move different on clay than grass and grass than hard courts, mm -hmm. but you can play similar styles now on all the surfaces and you couldn't do that before. You think that uh, this new generation and the, the younger players nowadays that they they are able to to sleep in, in even in the hard courts? It will make it uh, easier for uh, American players to adapt to, to the clay specific of, of movement? Yeah, you, it's amazing now. You see this, right? You see this on the hard court, the big mm -hmm. slide, Monfils and, and Djokovic and all the really powerful players. You're seeing them slide on hard courts. Whenever they do this, my knees feel like they're going to break and my <laughs> ankle. But I don't understand how it's happening. But the movement and the power is very different. Um, But I, I think most of the players, like I've, you know, been with Taylor Fritz on clay before, and uh, he knows how to slide because he's played enough on clay that he knows how to slide into the shots. But I think you're right. I think it's an important thing that many of the young players don't get. The the speed of the surface, you know, the many few, not not many few players, uh, sorry, not many players did like winning Roland Garros and winning Wimbledon, you know, just a few of them, even Adal, Federer, and a couple more maybe. Uh, you think that the surface are getting slower in the way of the hard courts and the, the grass court because some players complain the speed of the courts. In Wimbledon, they say that it's a bit slower since Nadal is being what he is. He's an insane and amazing player, but mm -hmm. there are some players they say that those courts are getting slower and you were saying that the, the styles and the, and the pitch time, you're seeing difference, you know, between the yeah, players yeah. and now you don't see that much. You think it's because of the speed of the surface? I, I do, I do. And I, I remember that I coached Tim Henman right after I coached Sampras and Tim was very excited to try to do well at Wimbledon. But right in those years, around 2002, three, four, All of a sudden, the courts got slower and the balls got a little softer and heavier at Wimbledon. And so the conditions there started to slow down. And in that same time, more of the hard court surfaces on the tour became slower and higher bouncing. And the clay maybe got a little faster. So yeah. everything's kind of coming into the middle now, right? So they're yeah. all kind of coming together. So for me, I actually think that's helped this era of great players even become more great because yeah. they don't have yeah. they don't have to change so much. Yeah. You know, they don't have to adjust in in you know in Becker's era, you know, he's playing the great clay quarters on clay. Sampras is playing the great clay quarters and then whoever Most, you know, Bruguera wins the French Open, and then he's got to deal with Krychek on grass. You know, we're not seeing so much of these big differences yeah. now. Less diversification. Yeah. Right. So the players, because the way I try to say it is because the surfaces are so close and the conditions are so close, Roger, Rafa, Novak are 5% better. Else. That doesn't mean they're going to win 5% more. It means they're going to win 95% more because there's l less other things are moving yeah. around. So yeah. they're just this much better. But in three out of five sets, they're not having to adjust so much. You know, there's not so many different court speed specialists. They all play yeah. okay on everything. So yeah. because of that, they're just better. So they're going to win a lot more, if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, About Tim Menman, you said that the, the moment you started coaching him and on the 2000s, something we started with him, that the courts were getting slower on that moment. You think that's one of the reasons why he 
he was not able to get the success he w really wanted to get the Wimbledon title because every year you were hearing the people saying, is this the year, is this the year? Of course, he had uh, a big pressure, you know? Yeah, yeah, very, He's very big pressure for Tim. And and uh, he, he, to me, look, the margins at the top were so small. I think he, to me, is one of the, a great example of being a professional. He got to be ranked four in the world. Yeah. He's gotten, I don't know how many semifinals of Wimbledon, four or five, four, four, four yeah. yeah. And, and the year I coached him in 2004, he got to the semis of Roland Garros, semis of the US Open. And I actually think he was a great clay court player for the exact reason that we were talking about. He was a great mover. He could slide yeah. and he had very good feel. And he drove the traditional clay court players crazy because he would slice and bring them to the net. Then he would chip and come in and he was very good mover and good volley. But during the grass courts, I remember in 2002 when he lost to Goran in the semifinals, that was kind of the last year that the court speed was pretty fast. And I remember talking to him um, about that match and how difficult that was. And then when I started working with him in 2004, he was so frustrated because the speed had dropped so much. Yeah. The balls were softer and, yeah. and, and the I courts guess the, were- the, the next year he played the, on the semis with Leitenewit and the Leitenewit won. And the, maybe he was the first non-big server winning right. in Wimbledon. Yeah, in a while, right? Yeah. And then he you know, Hewitt and Albandian, and then all of a sudden things changed a little bit. And a very interesting story back then was when I started coaching Roger, Pete couldn't believe everyone staying, Sampras couldn't believe everyone staying back on grass courts. So Roger came through LA and I said, come out to dinner. So we went out to dinner with Roger and Pete. And it was so interesting to hear them talk, just Pete saying, what's going on? Why is everybody staying back on the grass now? What's going on? What happened to Wimbledon? When we played in 2001, you're serving and volleying, you're coming forward. And Roger just said, I don't know, everyone's starting to stay back more now. For, and for me, that's comfortable. So I don't have to come in so much. So I can stay, I can serve and volley some. I still play fast tennis because I'm on the yeah. baseline. Yeah. And Pete just couldn't understand how it changed that much. So he was very interested by that. There was a big change as well with Agassi when he was one of the first one having a great, great, great return as well and making the people to volley very low when they're already attacking, you know? Really? Can you hear me or no? What's the game of you or no? You're on mute. You're on microphone. But I, I take it. Okay. Uh, uh, now we're back. Yeah, you're back, I think, now. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I missed uh, the last. No, I was saying like it was a big change. Like it was in the past when you had the servant volley, and then you start having the returners, the big ones, and you start having the ball on the low or lower volleys, and then you were able to take time from them. And then that was one of the first big changes in tennis. You know, now we have another one that they slowed down the courts in Wimbledon, and then the court stopped being like servant volley all the time. Right. No, you're exactly right. And, and I think one of the reasons that you're able to return differently is the rackets. The rackets got a little bit lighter and the strings, I think the change in the strings allows the good returners to be very stretched out and they can still dip the ball. They can still get the ball yeah. to get at your feet. And, yeah. and they couldn't do that. You know, before Guga was playing, before Guga was playing, he was the first one with the new strings that was allowing the ball to really go. But before that, no one's really hitting returns that are way, way stretched out and still ripping the return and getting it to do this. Now you watch everybody return serve and it's incredible. I mean, it's amazing what, can ha what you can do with better athletes, better technology and better equipment. Now it's very difficult to serve in volley, but I still think you can serve in volley a little bit. A little bit. If you're a good athlete, you should still be able. But now people ask me, why aren't people serving and volleying? And I'm saying, when's the last time you think anyone's seen a serve and volleyer? So all these yeah. kids for 10, 15 yeah. years, they never saw a serve and volleyer. So they don't even know. It does. It's not in their head. Now yeah. everyone wants to play yeah. like Rafa or Novak or Roger. Yeah. So 
for the last 10 years, that's what they're watching. So no one's teaching them to serve in Bali, which is interesting. Something that you tried that Taylor does? Uh, he doesn't serve in Bali, not, not really, but I want him to learn. I think he's two years from being someone that can serve in Bali a little bit. Right now, he doesn't serve in Bali at all. He's got a big first serve and then big ground strokes. But he needs to get better at the net. And we're starting that. And at 22 years of age, he has some time to do this. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So, Paul, you, you work at the Lawn Tennis Association. Uh, in your opinion, what does Great Britain need to generate a top player? Um, they need Andy Murray to get healthy. <laughs> uh, besides Andy, besides oh, besides Andy. Andy. because they, <laughs> okay. they really um, did there's Andy, but besides Andy, they have so much potential. The coaches there are so good. They invest so much in the in tennis courses, in the information on the coaches, you know. But then the players don't Edmund. come out, you know. Yeah, you have yeah, Kyle, Kyle Edmund as yeah, well. Kyle Edmund. Yeah. Dan, Dan Evans is almost 30 years old now, and he's ranked yeah. 28. No, I, I think it's a very interesting culture. And I remember from when I coached Tim, there's an amazing amount of pressure there because think yeah. of how small England is and how much emphasis is put on Wimbledon. It's a little yeah. small country and so much emphasis. And guess what? Now, I, I think they have 30 newspapers. So oh. there's a lot of pressure for young people to all of a sudden become tennis players. And there, I remember when Tim played, people used, I used to get picked up at the airport and the taxi driver would say to me, ask me what I did. And I tell them I coached Tim Henman. They go, Oh, he can't win anything. <laughs> <laughs> four, in the, four in the world. He's pretty good. He just hasn't won. Ah, he's no good. I'm like, <laughs> he's pretty good. He's four in the world. So I think some of it is mental. I think some of it is that they don't have a very deep talent pool. They don't have a lot of yeah. people playing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they're trying to figure that out. I think football takes a lot of people yeah. – a lot of young kids out of tennis and into football. So they're trying to get a bigger talent pool. Um, but I, I think it's a very interesting question for all of these countries, US, England, France, Australia, that generate all this revenue from their Grand Slam tournaments. That's their challenge. How do we yeah. use this to grow the game and also grow more great players? It's a, very, it's a hard um, equation to figure out the answer to. Yeah, I've been uh, last year. I was traveling uh, in Spain, in uh, France. I went to two grade one tournaments, or one grade two and one grade one junior tournament with some player. And uh, it was impressive to see the facilities they have. And uh, we're talking with many coaches and the amount of money that the French Federation has. So usually the countries with the Grand Slam, you have they have a lot of money to invest. You know, so. Those countries are the ones that we are expecting more to for more players. You know, the French Federation, for I heard, they they have a good system of competition. You know, of uh, organization, the funds for the players to, to keep improving. Usually, they had regional uh, high performance centers. Now they have some coaches where they give money to the player for them to move, and then we have the biggest one in uh, at, at Roland Garros. You know, right. Uh, so I think those countries are the ones in Australia. I have an Australian player, and uh, she said, like, Australia, it's nice, but it's in the middle of nowhere. You're far from everywhere. You want to get level, you need to come to Europe, and then you have 24 hours, you know? And uh, she said, like, here the mentality is totally different. The, it's more demanding here, you know? So maybe in case of Australia, they need another type of mentality. In case of France and, and uh, England, they need to restructure a little bit, maybe. I don't know. I think I think you're, I think there are different challenges. I think actually France and England should be in the best scenario, just because of the population density of all the European players there. I think it's healthier. It's more likely that you can have an a, an easier pathway to figure out how to maximize talent. I think in uh, Australia it's different because they're so far away. It's hard to do it in isolation, like I said. Yeah. And in many ways, I actually think the U you know, U.S. is like that. You know, U.S. is basically six hour flight from one side of the country to the other and five hours from the north to the south. So if you have players in all different corners, it's very, 
difficult. I think it's very difficult to have a decentralized model in a big area if you want to have a lot of really top-notch players. I, I think it's difficult to do that. I think it's much more simplified if you get all of your best players in a centralized location. So when you look at Europe and the configuration of the countries that are so close to each other, you can get a lot of mix and match philosophies and also styles of play. And I think that that helps players from a very young age try to figure out how to maximize their potential. Yeah. Okay, Paul, we are, we are aware of your um, three steps method. Can you talk uh, about it a little bit with us? And uh, if you still use it, uh, or if you used it with Taylor when you started working with him? Well, you tell me the three steps method. What is that? What is that? How, how does it sound to you? Tell me, you tell me the versions of it that you have. Well, you when when did you write the book? Sorry, two thousand maybe three years ago. Two thousand six. No, maybe maybe more than that. Two thousand seventeen, sixteen. I'm getting too old. It just it goes together. <laughs> I assume I assume that you you used it with uh, with Pete and maybe Roger and Tim, and for sure you 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 were successful using it. Right? Well, I look the the way I categorize the talent the the to define talent is the head, the heart, and the physical. Okay, so I, I, I categorize it in those three different areas and that's what makes you up as a tennis player, those three different areas, right? So when I look at a player, I try to figure out which of their strengths are in which area and then maximize their game around that. With, with, with a developed player, with someone like Pete and Roger and Tim, they're true professionals already. Right. So you kind of know what they what they can do as players, you know, their strengths and weaknesses and you figure out which area they need some help in. The best players are very high in the head and the heart and the talent is the physical mm -hmm. talent, the ability to hit the tennis ball, running, jumping, stopping, starting, no, athletic. No one you count God, God given talent, right? Right. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the head is the ability to think when there's adversity or pressure or a big moment, can you think and strategize and get through tough situation? And the heart is the ability that no matter what's happening, you can do this and fight. You know, that's Nadal. No matter what happens with Rafa, all that matters is the next point. Whatever happened is gone. Whatever's gonna happen is not there. All that matters is the next point. So the heart, the head and the talent and the best players are very high in all of those areas, right? So yeah. what you want to do for, for me, for a young player, is you want to practice themes so that all of these areas naturally become very good habits. So if you practice hard all that, Rafa didn't all of a sudden just decide, I'm going to work really hard today. He's been practicing like this his whole life. So that's normal for him. So when they ask him in a press conference, about things and you hear his very simple answer, it's because that's what he's done his whole life. I try as hard as I can, all that matters is the next point. I try as hard, you know, so mm -hmm. that you want all of these habits to be ingrained when they're young. You want them to work on the head, the ability to think under pressure. So when you have a 12, 13, 14 year old who's always looking at his coach, who's always complaining about everything, who doesn't take responsibility for a bad shot selection or the, the wind was bad, the sun was in my eyes, I got a bad call, whatever. You wanna change those habits when they're young because then those three categories get very high and that no matter what the physical talent is, they're much more likely to reach their potential. So when you get an older player, you know where their strengths are, you know which categories are really high. And I was very lucky because the players that I was with all three categories are really high. But if someone's concentration goes up, and like I spent some time with Sloane Stevens when she was 21 years old, and she was unbelievable talent, unbelievable physical talent. Um, the mental talent was up and down, goes up and down. And then the heart goes up and down because of the mental talent. But she was very young, so she hasn't, she hasn't matured those skills yet. So for me, I never worried about, and I still don't worry about Sloane Stevens' forehands or backhands. It's can she consistently 
lock in mentally? And can she consistently give herself the opportunity to figure things out? When she won the U.S. Open in 2017, she didn't even play very well for me as a tennis coach. She was just so good here and so good here that she didn't play badly. She just played okay. But because she's so good here and here, her average physical gifts are so good, she's going to beat most of the women anyway. So for me, that's why I look at a, an athlete like Sloan and I go, she should automatically be five in the world all the time. So good physically that if she's locked in like Rafa or Sharapova every point, she's going to beat 90% of the women anyway. But that's been one of her challenges, has been able to try to get those two areas like this. So as a coach, you're always trying to figure out how to press the right buttons to get them to learn those things. Right, right, right before I, I read about, uh, about that, uh, that method, uh, my first thought was, I mean, this uh, Paul had the, the easiest job in the world, no? Like coaching yeah. Pete Sampras and Roger yeah, Federer. Exactly, right. right next. Yeah, right just throw the balls after, out after that. The, throw the balls out on the court. And say good luck, guys. Go get them. I'll see you later. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go exactly. get a beer. See you later. But like a second later, I was like, wait a minute. So, how does a coach that his job is to to improve and to make a, a player playing better? Like, how do you make your Pete Sampras and the Roger better? So I can I think it's it's easier for a coach to like to isolate some areas to keep things simple. You're right, and, and and that was one of the things I learned from Pete Sampras very early on. He said it's it's much easier to get somewhere than to stay there. And he said for me to win the U.S. Open wasn't easy, but I got hot and I played great tennis for two weeks when I was 19, and I win the tournament, and then my world changes. My world changes, so everything's different. So then I have to reevaluate and figure it out, and then I've got to figure out how to stay there. And do I want to stay there? And he told me it took him a while to get to the place where he really, all that mattered was how long he could stay great and how many majors he could win. And really, to me, his most his best accomplishment is what he said to me, his best accomplishment is not winning 14 majors. It's six years in a row, number one at the end of the mm -hmm. year. So that means six years, and no one's ever done that before. You know, Connors did five. I think Roger's done five, maybe. But no one's gone six in a row. And to me, that's about staying at an unbelievable level, right? So every year you're finishing number one. You may be two or three during the year. You may drop. But by the end of the year, after all the results are in, you're back to number one. So for me as a coach, you have to constantly ask the player and challenge them. In a, not challenge in a confrontational way, just in a, tell me what your goals are. What do you want to do? What are you looking for this year? What's what's an opportunity for you to challenge yourself? And that's why in this era, it's very difficult for me to even understand. Like I watch Roger now. I don't even know why he plays. I mean, I don't know why he wants to play. You know, he's 38 years old, four beautiful kids, 20 major titles, more money than he ever needs, beautiful family. Lovely guys got to, why do you want to keep doing this? You know, why do you, to me, it's amazing that he does all, everything you have to put your body through, right? He's been doing it for 20 years. Now he just had another surgery last week and yet he still wants to push himself. So to me, that's amazing. I, I don't, it's hard for me to understand that. It's hard for me to understand that ability to want that for that long. It's to be a limitless passion for, for playing yeah. and keeping and keep uh, working in the, in the circuit. Yeah, that, and that's believe when you ask him, that's what he'll say. I, I love tennis and I love my life. I, I still love doing this. And I'm like, okay, that's great. It's amazing. Uh, when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you started with, uh, with Pete, we were too young. Not saying that you were old, but uh, we were still well, very I'm young. Old when you're young. <laughs> and uh, at that time, our question is did he have already that amazing second serve? You know, he, he always had a very heavy second serve, you know, was good speed. And, you know, it's kind of like imagining trying to return a serve and trying to return a serve that feels like a soccer ball hitting your racket. You know, that's what his second serve feels like. It's so heavy. It like you hit it in your arm, you know, 
And when he was younger, he could hit it very hard. But as he got older, that's when he got unbelievably accurate with it too. But when he was younger, he wasn't as accurate, but because it was so heavy, he could get away with it. But as he got older, I couldn't believe how good he was at hitting locations, even on second serves at very high speeds. Very, He trusted it unbelievable amount. It was something that you said, Pete, Let's we need to work on this. All, yeah, that was, was something all, that, that he was told you, coaching. Paul. I need to be better on this. You're that was all coaching. <laughs> that part was all coaching. That's what we thought. That's what we thought. When we were making yeah. this question, I said, nah, it's gonna be all Paul. Yeah. <laughs> now look, we, we talked about it, and he, you know, he was very interesting because he knew he could judge and understand players that he's playing against and what he needs to win. In 1997. When he won the uh, Wimbledon, when he beat Andre in the finals, I think it's 97, he beat Andre in the finals. In the finals, his second serve speed average went up seven or nine miles per hour in the entire tournament against Andre. And I looked at it, and I remember after the match talking to him that night at the champion's dinner, and I said, you know your serve – is bigger today than it's big the entire tournament. And he said, yeah, I know. And he said, how much? And I told him, and he goes, yeah. I said, well, I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I'm going to win most of the matches anyway, but against Andre, I got to serve big. Well, I can. And so I just do. So it doesn't feel risky. He said, no, I can serve big. And I know, I know against Andre, I have to, because he's a great returner which is a very interesting mentality, right? It doesn't feel risky, but if he's playing a guy ranked 38, instead of hitting 113 mile an hour second serve, it's 102 because he knows he can still hit the spot and it doesn't need to be 113. But against Andre, he's got to be able to hit that spot. Otherwise, it's going to come back and it's going to be a winner. Okay, Paul, uh, you've said that Roger Federer was super receptive to criticism. Uh, do, you do you think this will, this will of learning and wanting to, if, for him to improve every day is the key to stay at the highest level, level for such a period, long period of time? I think so, yeah, because he's very, um, he's very interested, right? He's, he's interested in learning. He's competitive, but he's also interested in hearing different philosophies. He's interested in hearing different ideas. You have to be able to convince him. You have to be able to make sure that if you're giving him an idea or a strategy, you better have the information to back it up because he'll question you. He'll say, well, what do you mean by that? That doesn't make sense. So you better be able to back it up. But he's, he's truly curious and truly interested in trying to figure out new ways to be better than what he is today. And I think that that helps him and that goes along with his joy of just loving the game you know and that's what's been able to help him sustain this passion for so long uh, between between roger and pete which one do you think uh, had more uh, confidence on, on himself i think pete had more confidence and i and i think it's a quiet confidence but pete had more confidence in that. And Roger, I think he knows how great he is, but it's in a subtle, more subtle feeling. Roger's very confident. He totally trusts himself, but Pete was different. Pete was very quiet. Pete had a very different aura about him than Roger does. Roger talks to everybody in the locker room. He's at the tournament talking to everyone behind it. Everybody knows him. And if you don't know him, and you're in the tennis world, it feels strange because he's so friendly. Because Pete was more isolated, he had an aura that was very different. And, and I think that that different aura intimidated a lot of the people that he played against. And, and it gave him a very quiet kind of ruthless competitiveness. Didn't say much, but you knew that he was like this, laser focused in. Killer instinct, right? Yeah. <laughs> you think that the, that Roger, the, that ability to, to listen and all is trying to improve, 
um, being him number one, it's something that uh, the younger kids, that obviously they are not as good as Roger, uh, is a problem that they, they don't listen and they sometimes they think that, okay, I know, I know more than enough, uh, this coach is saying to me this and that, I don't need to listen. You, you think that's something that uh, the, this new generation lacks of, of uh, awareness? I think so, maybe a little less intention span. You know, then you need to get it in quicker, more quickly, and also a little less patience. Maybe they think they know more than they do know. Um, but, but I think that that's human nature too. And, and part of that, I think, is a strength. Because if you have someone that thinks they know a lot and they're on the court, that tends to translate into fire. Like into, if they know a lot and they're stubborn, they tend to be it's able it's to- It's well-guided, right? Yeah, they tend to compete really well. But you don't want that as blind stubbornness. You know, there comes a point where that stubbornness and that fight and that fire is awesome, but there are times where you have to drop your guard when you're talking to the people around you that you trust to hear what they're saying to try to get better. So, it, and Taylor's like this, Fritz is like this. He's really stubborn and he thinks he knows a lot. He thinks he knows a lot more than he knows at 22. But I also know he's an unbelievable competitor. I've seen him win a million matches already just by fighting and being stubborn and not giving it. You know, I've seen him win matches when he's sick, when he's injured, when he's and I love that. And I think that those two characteristics go hand in hand. So you have to be a little and I'm careful with Taylor. I, I want I want him to be strong. I want him to I want him to have that. But I not to the point to where he shuts me out. Because if he does that, there's no sense of me being around or whoever's around. If, you, if you're totally shut out, then it doesn't work. So there's a balance that I have to have when I communicate with him where I encourage that fire and the competitiveness, but also I can kick him in the backside, kick him in his ass and say, no, now it's time you listen. You just listen. And, <laughs> and, and he's good. He laughs about it and then he'll listen. You know, but he lets me say that, so we know how to have uh, how to have that dynamic and and try to build on it. Communication is is the key between the coach and the player because yeah. today it's not easy sometimes to pass the message. I know you have to be very, have to be very good at texting and WhatsApp and everything else. You don't want to talk emojis, so much. Exactly. all the emojis, exactly. Uh, so Roger played a lot of games against Rafa and Novak. Uh, how did you prepare, it, prepare tactically and mentally for those games? Which difference in preparation did you have when facing them in hard court and clay court? I think, you know, look, everyone knows they play each other so much. I mean, between the three of them, they played hundreds of times, all three of these guys. So, so there's not very many secrets. You know, it's really about who's going to execute better on that day. They know what they need to do. Um, and, and with Rafa, it's always challenging because of the one-handed backhand and the lefty forehand to the one-handed backhand. In the last few years, as Rogers got the bigger racket head and got more comfortable playing on the baseline, except on the clay, he's got more comfortable playing Rafa because he can deal with that a little bit better. Um, Novak is very interesting because he's such a good defender. What he makes Roger do is he makes... Roger go closer to the lines than he wants to go. And so that's why in big moments you see Roger or offensive players against Novak make more mistakes because Novak moves so well that instead of hitting the ball this far from the sideline, you have to hit it this far from the sideline. And over time, as the pressure builds, it gets really hard to hit the ball that far from the sideline. And, and he, he punishes you if you miss those targets. So Novak is an interesting dynamic. Rafa is interesting because of the leftiness, but I don't prepare them any different. I don't prepare for those matches any different than any other match. They know each other unbelievably well. Um, you try to figure out what was successful the last few times, what wasn't. You have those conversations about that and try to encourage them to get into those patterns to create those successful moments, especially in the big times of the match. But the most, the thing that I like the best is with them, it's almost like 
just go play because they play each other so much that it's fun to just sit back and watch them try to figure it out. That's what I love about tennis. It's as much as I love to coach it. I love that the players, they've got to figure it out out on the court in these huge moments. They have to sit there and go, okay, how do I problem solve now? How do I get out of this? And to me, that's really interesting. There's many approaches now that you can do, but the people, the coaches now, we everyone is trying a lot to, so to give the, the player the, so how you can solve the problem, you know, like instead of giving the solution, what could, you, what could you have done on this situation to get better or to do it a bit better? It's something that you do a lot with Teller now. Yeah, I mean, and this is where and this is where he gets stubborn sometimes because you know he'll take a he'll choose a shot which I will think is a ridiculous shot. He'll be in the backhand corner behind the baseline, almost in the doubles alley, falling backwards, and he'll hit a flat forehand down the line over the high part of the net, 200 miles an hour, and he'll miss it. And he'll go, I got that shot. <laughs> that shot, but why would you choose that shot in that moment? There's no, and you're like, oh, that's my favorite shot. It's my favorite. <laughs> yes, but it's the lowest percentage, you know, so that, so, so you have to help them understand the difference between good mistakes and bad mistakes. If they're good mistakes, I don't mind because we're going to practice the right things, right? We're going to practice. So if you make good shot choices and you just miss, that's fine. You're playing the right way. Some days you just miss balls. That's okay. But if you miss balls and make bad shot selection, that's frustrating because you're giving yourself a lower percentage to make the shot anyway, but yet you're still trying to make that shot. That gets frustrating. Yeah, I see a lot of times my player that if you make a mistake, let's just make one yeah. mistake. Don't make two mistakes at the same right. time, you know. Exactly. Just, just go for one, and then we know that we are on the right path, and then we, by working, we'll get there. Exactly. But just one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Paul, nowadays the points are getting much shorter than before uh, with players being more aggressive on the first two or three shots. How do you work it with Taylor and how do you balance the, that aggressiveness with the work of the consistency from the baseline? Well, you do a lot of rhythm things to work on consistency, a lot of cross courts, cross court down the line. So you always have that rhythm but you want to emphasize your style of play, um, mostly <clears throat> understanding how you need to play. So for Taylor, it's about the serve and first strike. And it's about every second serve that you get a look at, aggressive on the return and aggressive first strike. I'm not worried about his ability because I know he has the rhythm to do it, but it's about finding ways to get in control of the point from the beginning, because as you said, the points are shorter. So. You just have to emphasize the fact that the beginning of the rallies are even more important. Okay, uh, we have here a question on the chat. Okay, uh, the question is, who was easier to coach? Who was easier to coach? I, I, I uh, uh, none. <laughs> I've been very lucky that all of them are very, I've, all the players have been very easy Roger and Tim liked to talk the most like they would take a lot of information you could Pete you had to give him information quickly like he didn't want to sit there for 30 minutes and go through a strategy you have to give him five or six things and that's it and do it quickly and then just let him go so it's about knowing the personalities, but I, I've been lucky. All, all of my players, Sloan was easy to coach. Taylor's been easy. So I, I, I think part of coaching is figuring out how to manage the player's personality anyway. Thank you, Paul. Get, getting back almost to the, to the first question, talking about Taylor, um, that he's 22 and he's at 24th in the ranking and he was number one in the world as a junior. Uh, how high are the expectations for his career in the U.S.? And how do you manage them with him? Well, I mean, he wants to be a great player. I try to, I try not to define anything by putting numbers on it. Really, um, when we do talk about numbers, I talk about 
you know, now the goal is to get in the second week of majors, to get to the second week of a Grand Slam. He's been to the third round a bunch of times. Next goal is to get to the second week. This year, last year he got to the finals of two, three, he won one tournament, I think got to the finals of two others, two fifties. So this year was trying to do better at the bigger events. And he got to the finals of a 500 in Mexico. So it's about a progression. I don't really look at the expectation, but when we talk about it, I think when you look at how young he is and how old the other players are, top 10 should be a goal for him. And then once you are around that area, you never know what's going to happen, right? You just don't know who's injured, how good someone becomes, who drops out. So for me, a goal for him should be top 10 and you build around that. And and so that's kind of how I look at it. Uh, so you, let's go a little bit now to about Slow and Steven. So you said that she, she didn't have the mental. She was very inconsistent. There was one of the, the biggest troubles that you... So the biggest difference that you felt between working uh, with a woman and with a man? Well, no, I don't think it had anything to do with gender. I think Sloan was young. I think she was 21 when she started. And the year before, she got into the semis in Australia and beat Serena. So she, I think, all of a sudden, all these expectations came on her. And I think that became very difficult because I don't think that she was quite ready for that. Um, so I think she was just a little bit young in her mental part of her game and advanced in the physical part of her game. And so it took a while for it to catch up and she's still a little bit inconsistent, but she's had some injuries. She's had some issues that were out of her control, but I, I just think she's so physically gifted that that stuff will flatten out when she gets comfortable again. Um, but I don't think it was gender related at all. I just think because she was 21. Uh, how can you create that mental toughness and having that consistency? I think, I think it's habits, right? I, it's like I said early on. I think it's how you create the habits when players are young. You you make things difficult. You know, you make it difficult for them in practice. You you stay on them about not getting sloppy in practice. About every shot matters. And when you keep preaching and working that way. As you get older, that becomes normal. So that's just your normal way of being. You know, that's why one of the reasons why Rafa is so great is because yeah. that's what he's done his whole life. So I think you you start it with the habits, and you make it very disciplined and and their environment very difficult on them to to push them in a in a healthy way, but in a disciplined way. Okay, Paul. Uh uh what advice do you have for young coaches that are trying to make it in into the professional circuit um my biggest advice is to listen you know put put your antenna up and try to get a lot of ideas and listen to things and then think about them try to see what makes sense you know people tend to make judgments and conclusions very quickly and i feel like things change really fast in life and in tennis so Try to listen, try to listen to what's successful around you, watch successful people. And I think when you do that, it, it, it will give you a sense of how you should operate to be successful. So the biggest thing is, is to listen and learn. Okay, Paul, we now have uh, two challenges for you, for us to, to finish this in a, in a lighter vibe. Okay, okay. all right. So we've prepared a couple of uh, okay. short, uh, short answer questions. Okay, so the first one is, uh, who's the greatest male and female player of all time? Well, I'll tell you what I tell everybody else. I don't use that term because I think every era is different. And I think it's unfair to think that Rod Laver wouldn't be great in Pete's era. But Pete would beat Rod Laver just because of all the technology. But if Rod Laver grew up in Pete's era, I'm sure he would be unbelievably good. And so I always have a hard time. I, I feel, so I, I try to use the word who's the most accomplished because then you can just look at who has numbers. the most majors. Who, yeah, then you can look at numbers. And right now, I, my gut tells me that depending on what happens with the pandemic, I, I think Novak probably will have the most majors if he stays healthy. That's what I think. 
but um and i think serena has a couple more in her as well um but i don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic but after watching what rafa and roger have done i ne you just don't ever want to bet against them all of a sudden roger coming back and you know it's just so weird to even think at 38 39 years old he can do what he's doing but you never know but right now when you look at the statistics I, I, it looks to me like Novak has a very good chance to be the most accomplished. Okay, second one, uh, toughest loss as a coach. Wow, the toughest loss as a coach. Um, I think that the one, the one I've had, you know, not that many. Huh? No, I've had a lot. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had two years. I had two years in a row where Roger lost in the semis of the U.S. Open, having match points on Novak, two years in a row. And then uh, the year Roger lost to Rafa in the finals of the French in 2011, he lost in four sets. And I really thought he had a chance that year to beat Rafa. He beat Novak in the semis, and Novak hadn't lost yet the whole year. And the, the courts were playing really fast, and the balls were playing fast. And I thought that this was a really good chance. And the first set, Roger was up 5-2 against Rafa and had set point and tried to drop shot and then ended up losing that set. He lost a it was tough four sets. It was like 7-5, 7-6, 6-7, 6-4. -6 and I felt like that one really hurt because for me, because I really thought he was going to win against Rafa. I thought that was the best year on clay that he had a chance to win, and I thought he was going to win that match. And, so uh, if that's a, if that's the most painful thing you have to deal with in life, it's not so bad. It's okay. <laughs> and which rivalry was bigger, Sampras, Agassi, or Rafa and Roger? Um, I feel like I feel like Andre. I'm so Andre and Pete's was bigger because there was only two of them, and I feel in this era it's really rafa roger and novak. novak and so there's kind of a triangular thing and yeah. and and rafa has beaten roger more than roger so rafa wins that one and then novak has beaten both of those guys more than they've beaten him so it's kind of a triangular mm -hmm. thing so in pete and andre's era they're both americans you have the rebel guy that's you know has his own image and you have pete who's very quiet you have the great server against the great returner and it's the same culture. So I don't know if bigger is the right word, but it seems more clear. You know, it seems more clear. The, what was more enjoyable? Coaching a Grand Slam winner or a number one in the world? I mean, you coached both, but to, which one was more enjoyable? <laughs> I think the, the immediacy of watching a player win a major is, a, is pretty hard. You know, it, it is pretty hard to get better then because the number one in the world comes like you see the celebration on the court when you it's win Wimbledon. right right you see the celebration when pete broke the record and beat rafter in the finals of wimbledon in 2000 you know you could feel that right there when pete came back and um won the 2002 us open after he hadn't won a tournament in 25 months that's there's a feeling there that's so different you know when roger won wimbledon in 2012 he hadn't won a major in a couple of years won wimbledon in 2012 and then got to number one a couple of weeks after that was a combination of both things but i think that immediacy of seeing a major uh event winner is pretty special next one was it harder to write the book or is it harder to coach way harder to write the book not even close. <laughs> Luckily, I've got a beautiful wife who's way smarter than me, and I had some other people that helped. So <laughs> that made it easier. And the last one, Paul, did you watch the, the last dance about, about MJ? I did. I yeah. did. So if you if you had to, to name a tennis player for someone to make a documentary about, who would you choose? What, what's Tell me what the goal of the documentary is. Like, like uh, what's the, the to biggest get, to get to know a tennis player like we did uh, about MJ? Probably Rogers would be most interesting. 
only because I think he's more complicated because he has a big family. He's been doing this kind of from the end of one era into another era. And he's become such a global icon when you, when I watch him at sponsor events and, you know, fashion shows, and I see the diversity and the size of his world, I think he probably would be most interesting. I think Rafa's life is, is great, but it's probably a little more streamlined and simplified. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Novak, maybe he's not quite as interesting yet. Uh, I'll have to agree. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> would, yeah. Okay. I, none of them. None of them are bad. I just think Rogers is more compl complicated, more complex. So I think it would be interesting to watch it on screen more, probably. Yeah. But I think uh, Sampras is Sampras is like Jordan without without this. Like the Sam is, yeah, toughness. yeah. Uh, I don't think Rogers. Uh, Roger's not the same mentality. It doesn't make it better. It's not the same mentality as Michael, I don't think. Pete and Jordan, Tiger Woods, Kobe Bryant, those athletes. But Pete was very quiet. So you'd ever, like Kobe, you see this, mm -hmm. you know, Jordan, you see this, Tiger. But Pete in here is like that without, without this. But very interesting though, Sampras, unlike those guys, doesn't have to, he can turn off his competition. In other words, if he's playing golf, he doesn't have to beat you. He doesn't care, you know, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to win every ping pong match he plays. He's not like that. But on the tennis court, when he puts his mind to something, it's like a laser, if that In makes sense. Your score against him, it's still one zero to you, no? Yeah, I never <laughs> lost to the guy. I don't know why everyone thinks he's so great. I mean, I'm undefeated against him. <laughs> But you're great too. Uh, yeah, in my, uh, in my own, in my own you mind. Have to sound like I'm better than him, you know. Uh, my own mind, my own mind. Uh, we have here a last uh, question on the on the chat uh, from a player. She's saying that beside the mental strength, uh, which other qualities you do advise that the young Portuguese tennis player should uh, improve a lot? Uh, discipline and shot selection. If you have discipline in how you approach everything and you make good shot choices, you're going to have a good combination of being able to put yourself in a very good position. Perfect. So we have here the last challenge uh, for you to choose the best player for each shot. Okay. Uh, serve. I'm going to pick Sampras because I'm not going to pick the guys that are seven feet tall. Okay. Uh, forehand. Uh, Federer. Bakken. Uh, Djokovic. Volley. Um, Edberg. Uh, Edberg, or Hen Edberg or Henman. Okay. Uh, return. Djokovic. Uh, touch. Touch? Yeah, as a feeling, you know. Probably better. Uh, mobility. Um, Djokovic. Mentality. Nadal. The Great only point. different, the only thing that I could maybe switch is Agassi and Djokovic with the backhand. Either yeah. one of those guys I, I take. I did this a few weeks ago and I think I took Andre's backhand. And the return? Least, Just Djokovic? Djokovic because he's longer. He's taller. Yeah. Okay. That's why. But Andre, yeah. if he gets his racket on it, <laughs> the was amazing as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we reached the end of the episode and we wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk with us. We had an, a great, uh, an amazing time in the conversation. We learned a lot. I think I can speak for the three of us. And uh, yeah, wish you all the luck with Taylor Fritz. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you so much for your patience. I know you've been trying to do this for a while. So. I thank you very much, and I hope you guys all stay safe. And uh, hopefully, we do it again down the road. Hopefully, yeah, hope so. Hopefully. <laughs> thank you guys very much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. You have a great day. You too.